Volume. You need it louder. Increase the volume. Do you need it louder? Yes, 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 please. Louder. What he's talking about. Is it is it louder now? But he had a very strict idea about what meditation actually is. Good. Okay, I made it louder with a special speaker. A little bit more louder. That's it. Go to the maximum. Here it is. Now it's better. Do the monks, and he said, monks. Good. Are these forces of speech that others may use when they address you? Their speech may be timely or untimely. Headphones, headphones is better. Do I can hear, but not the speaker. Gentle or hard. Can you hear? I can hear on headphones. Spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. That's an extra when speaker. Address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. It's coming. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected, and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Now, that sounds like a pretty good daily activity to me. Or what are we really saying? It doesn't matter what somebody else says to you, that's their opinion, that's their idea. It can be the people can say things at the wrong time. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what you're doing with your own mind. When you're talking with someone, we need loving kindness to them. Okay, so somebody comes up and they're angry with you, radiate loving kindness to them. Don't pay attention to what they're angry about, because that isn't the real problem most of the time. What you want to do is radiate loving kindness to them, and then their mind will start to become more and more calm and more peaceful, and then you can discuss what the real problem is. So when you get done with that person and they go away, use that person as your reminder to send loving kindness to everybody around you. Practice sending loving kindness as much as we possibly can. If you want things in this country to get better, then send loving kindness all the time. 
it's a real important thing. Now, there's a lot of different ways of sending loving kindness. One way that I very much prefer is that you practice smiling all the time. You smile with your mind. You send loving kindness with your mind. You smile with your eyes. Little smile on your lips. Smile in your heart. The, the more you can remember to do that, the more you will affect the world around you in a positive way. Now, if you're if you are sending loving and kind thoughts to an individual person, it's best not to look them in the eye when you send that to them. Because that can be misunderstood. And that can cause all kinds of problems. So just keep your eyes down and radiate loving kindness, but having a smile on your face improves your mindfulness. And it causes a lot of trouble and friction between Now, that's a word that everybody's supposed to know what it means. When you're sending your but not many people actually do. There's all kinds of stories about mindfulness. But nobody gives you a definition of what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is remembering your reserve of the mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How does it move? The copy machine. You know, you're copying machine of someone. Now, when you use mindfulness in this way, you start to see that everything is part of a process. And you'll go much deeper into your objective meditation and how your mind works. You'll start to see that everything yeah. is yeah. part of a process called dependent oh. origination. Okay, I'll, this I'll is be how quiet. This works. I have to be quiet. Now, an interesting thing is that we all have hindrances arise at some time during the day, right? What's the cause of hindrances? Why do they arise? Where do they come from? You know? And hindrances arise because in the past, you've broken a precept. And you know you shouldn't have done it. You said something that's not true. You did something that you know is going to come back and bite you. You took something that wasn't yours. You killed some beings. All of these will cause hindrances to arise. Now, if you're sitting in meditation and the hindrance arises, don't fight with the hindrance. Don't try to push the hindrance away. Don't try to make the hindrance do what you want it to. The truth is, when a hindrance arises, it's there. That's the truth. That's the Dhamma of the present. When a hindrance arises, it's there. Now, before we go too, too much further, one of the things that it happens a lot in Sri Lanka if you ever go to visit there. You see a lot of people standing around with their arms crossed like this. Okay, you know what this does? 
when you have your arms crossed like this, you're protecting your heart. And this is a thinking posture, not a listening posture. So when you cross your arms like this, you're thinking about what's being said, maybe, or you start thinking about something else. They've done a lot of studies on this kind of body posture. And when your arms are crossed like this, you only hear about 60% of what's being said. So please get out of the habit of crossing your arms when you're listening to someone else. Okay, you don't need to protect your, your heart. Your heart is real strong. It will take care of itself. Now, getting back to hindrances. When you break a hindrance, your mind almost, you know, I'd have to say 100% of the time will say, I shouldn't have done that. Not good to do this. I'm going to I'm suffer because of it. And then you go around and forget it until you have a hindrance arise in your life. And it turns out to be quite difficult when you break hindrances. When you keep hindrances without breaking them, then it turns into a protection for you. And there's great benefit in keeping the hindrances without breaking them. Now, we try to get to the other section. I just wanted to kind of point out he is trying to say precepts. Uh, I think by mistake, he's saying uh, hindrances. Uh, no, he's talking about the hindrances that will come up and the precepts are caused when Correct. you break a precept, Correct. it Correct. causes the hindrance. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I tried to get to the second. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, tried to get close to the at, other. Uh, close in the, the corner, there is an X mark. You can close it. Here I go again. When you take care of Dhamma in this way, Dhamma will take care of you. That's it, right? Correct. You don't always necessarily get what you want, but you always get what you need. You got it? Yes, it is working. No, I, I have... Uh, a hundred acres of land in, in America. And I have a very beautiful meditation hall and a big dining hall and library and retreats. Having a lot of separate cookies for people to come and do retreats. How do I get that kind of thing to happen? Well, we keep our precepts and we take care of Dhamma. And it's really kind of an amazing thing because sometimes our funds get kind of low. And the treasurer comes to me and he said, oh, we're only going to be able to, to last one more month. And then we're going to have to find a way to make money. And he's very worried about that. And I tell him, don't worry about it. It's no problem. Ah, but we, we're, we're going to be broke. Okay, fine. The next day or two days, somebody sends us a check for $15,000. Oh, that took care of that problem. 
And whenever we decide to start building things, people start donating. And it's pretty amazing to watch it happen because all I'm doing is not worrying about money. It's not worth worrying about. But my job is to make other people happy. That's what my job is. Now, I know that there's a lot of monks that like to really focus on suffering and talk about suffering and get you very concerned and you become unhappy because everything in life is suffering according to them. The first noble truth is there is suffering in life. Not all life is suffering. And that's the wrong uh, translation. There is suffering in life. That's the first noble truth. There's the second. Excuse me. There's the second noble truth. What's the cause of suffering? Suffering is caused by craving. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, in the Samyutta Nikaya, oh. it talks about the right way to teach and the wrong way to teach. And this is from the Buddha's own mouth. It's not from me. He said the wrong way to teach is to talk about suffering and how dreadful life is. The right way to teach is about the cessation of suffering and how to get to that state. So the cessation of suffering means the letting go of craving. The more closely you can keep your precepts, the easier it is to learn how to meditate and you will progress very fast. Now, I've had a lot of students in America for many, many, many years. One student I had for over 30 years. Every time I gave a retreat, he was there. He did the retreat. But he didn't progress very well with his meditation. I kept on telling him, you're breaking precepts. He had a very owl mouth. <laughs> he was him. cursing all the time. And he would come to the retreat. He was doing a two-week retreat. The first 10 days was a lot of hindrances because he kept on breaking this precept. He kept on having hindrances. We're getting down to the near the end of the retreat. All of a sudden, his mind starts to calm down. And he has a little bit of progress. Now he's doing this over and over and over again. And always at the end of the retreat, he would say, oh, now I can go back to being the way I was. And 30 years of practice, and he didn't have much understanding of the Buddhist teaching. Finally, I got him to stop cursing, and his meditation took off after that. Don't sit that way, please. Don't cross your arms. And he was amazed at how fast his meditation took off and how fast he was progressing. And he said, why didn't this happen before? 
because the only thought Buddhism was about sitting in meditation for a period of time and then going back to life and acting the way you always act. No, that's not right. You want to make sure you keep your precepts as closely as you can. The whole thing with meditation is that it's not just about sitting as still as the Buddha image. It's about life. It's about living. I wrote a book. It's called Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life. And it's pretty comprehensive. It, it, it gives you the idea that you have hindrances in your daily activity. It's not just when you're sitting in meditation. And you have to be able to recognize that and let go of those hindrances. That leads to having a happy mind. That leads to having a peaceful mind, a mind that has equanimity, has balance in it. As you do it more and more, you start understanding what the Buddha was talking about when he, he said in the Dhammapada, we're the happy ones. The first part of meditation. Is practicing your generosity. I'm not talking about giving food to monks, although that's a nice way to keep, keep monks alive. That's a, a good thing. But practice smiling and giving your smile away. With your daily activity. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. The easier it is to see when your mind starts getting heavy and having this hindrance come up. So, you accept it more quickly or let go of it more easily. It really does work for you. So the more you practice smiling and giving your smile away, the more you start affecting the world around you in a positive way. I know that an awful lot of people are doing meditation and they're thinking they're just doing it for themselves. No. You're doing meditation so that you can affect not only how you uh, how you work in your daily life, but also help other people to be have happy minds, we have uplifted minds. We have to help each other. One of the problems that's happening, especially in America, when I went back, when I left here and went back to America in uh, 1998, as I was flying in on the airplane, I started feeling really, really strong grief, really, really strong anger and hatred. And I wanted to go up and tell the, tell the pilot, I want to go back. I don't want to go here. But I, I promised too many people that I was coming. So I had to, I had to stay in there. America is made for something bigger. A lot. Greedy. Money is king. Well, it's not. The king is helping other people to overcome their suffering. That's what we need to do. How easy is that? Smile. Make them laugh. Make them feel good. 
help in whatever way we can. That's what this, this sutta is about. Learning how to practice mother and all the time. Am I doing anything? And the more you do it, I'm sorry. the easier I'm your life becomes, and the more you affect other people around you in a positive way. Now, keeping your precepts is a very important aspect. I've had some people say, oh, okay, I, I want to be rich. How do I, how am I going to get rich? So it's easy. First, you practice your generosity. Now, everybody, every time I say something like that, people think I'm talking about money. I'm talking about material things. And I'm not. Although, if you want to help with money and, and food and other things like that, great, that's, that's fine. But it's about a mental state that I'm talking about. It's about a mental state that's uplifting, a mental state that's happy. Give your happiness away as much as you can. Help other people to smile. Help other people to laugh and have fun. And the more you do that, the more prosperous you're going to become. The second part of meditation is keeping your precepts. When I say the precepts, are a protection for you, and they really are. You will not die from an accident. You will not die from an unnatural death if you keep your precepts without breaking. And when you get into a situation that is very stressful, You'll be able to do the right thing at the right time. If you see somebody that they've just gotten into an accident and they need help, you'll know exactly what to do at the right time. Don't fold your arms like that, please. Not you, who is it? I try to change it again, okay? Okay. Hi. Um, okay. It is a bad habit to pull your arms like that because you get yes. used to it and you start saying, well, this is my natural way of being. But your natural way of being is thinking instead of listening. And that can get you in all kinds of troubles with your job, with, with your daily life. In the Jataka tales, there's a story about the Bodhisattva. And he lived in a village where everybody kept their precepts. And they were quite prosperous. Everybody was pretty happy with each other. They didn't fight a lot. They didn't gossip. They were very good people. And the Bodhisattva was going to be going to a school that was a fairly long ways away, over 100 miles away. And the teacher that was there, heard that the Bodhisattva would not break a precept. He kept his precepts without breaking them. And the Bodhisattva told him that 
He would not die a natural death. He would die a natural death. And the teacher decided, well, I'm going to test this. So he got some bones and he went to the Bodhisattva's father mm -hmm. in this village. He said, I had some bad news for you. Your, your son fell off a cliff and he's dead. And the father said, no, I don't believe it. Can't happen. Impossible. Well, why? Because he keeps his precepts and he doesn't break them. Well, okay, he keeps his precepts, but he still he fell off a cliff. Here's his bones. See? No, I don't believe it. Somebody else's bones. Not my son's. So the teacher was pretty convinced that it was a good thing to keep the precepts when he went back. So everything in life becomes easier. I'll tell you another story. I have some friends back where I live. So um, they one are very stingy with money, and two, so the, uh, they have a tendency to gossip every day a lot. Never know what what you can believe what they say. They have the worst karma with their vehicles. They buy a car, breaks down. They are always out of money because of they are not following their precepts and not practicing their generosity. And this is constant. It constantly happens. They finally get the car up and running, and it runs for a week, and then a rock comes and hits the windshield, and now they have to replace the windshield. And this is a constant thing for them. And I keep trying to tell them, practice your generosity. Practice keeping your precepts. Don't be saying things and making up stories that aren't true. They tried it for a week. And they didn't have any trouble with their cars that week. So I said, okay, try it for another week. They started to save a little bit of money. And they didn't have these problems keep coming up and taking their money away. So keeping your precepts is an important thing if you want to be prosperous. It's a real helpful thing. And other people appreciate you when they know that you they can trust what you say. I was just in uh, Sri Lanka. I just came back up from Sri Lanka. And one of the things I noticed about Sri Lankans, they, they want to be very polite. You ask them to help you, they will say, Absolutely, I will help you. <laughs> Never do. And then it comes time to <laughs> need that help that they should have already done. They haven't done it. Well, do it yourself. What is that doing for the Sri Lankan people? They are poor. Why are they poor? Because they're breaking the precept. They're saying that they will do something without the intention of following through and doing it. So they're using wrong speech. And that's a problem. If you depend on somebody to do something 
And I, I have a, a box of books in Sri Lanka that's been there for three years. And the head monk that said he was going to send it to me, I kind of forgotten about it. <laughs> so I don't get to have those books. I need them. But he's breaking a precept, and as a result, an awful lot of the Sri Lankans suffer because they don't keep the precepts as closely as they need to. So, the next part of the meditation. First, you have your generosity, then you have your keeping of precepts, is the mental discipline of <laughs> mental development. That's what these little brochures are all about. Now, these are talking about right effort. <clears throat> if you follow what it says in these brochures, you will progress very quickly in your meditation promise. When a hindrance comes up, you don't fight with the hindrance. You don't try to make the hindrance stop or go away. You accept the fact that in the past you broke a precept. Now you let that, that hindrance be. You recognize when your mind has gone away from your object of meditation. You release the distraction. How do you release the distraction? You release the distraction by letting that distraction be there by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. Don't watch it. Let it be and relax. Now, your brain has two parts to it, right? Two lobes. There's a membrane that goes around them. It's called the meningue. <coughs> Excuse me. It's just basically a bag that holds your brains together. Good boy. Every time you have a thought. Good boy. Every time there's a feeling arising, every time there's a sensation, your brain gets a little bit bigger and it presses against the meninges and it causes some tension and tightness. What is that tension and tightness? That is how you recognize craving. What is craving? When a feeling arises, if it's a pleasant feeling, craving says, I like it. When it's a painful feeling, craving says, I don't like it. Now, the thing that's in common here is this is the very beginning of the wrong belief in a personal self. I am that. Now, when you break the precept at your city and you have a hindrance arise, the hindrances is showing where your attachment is. What is attachment? It is craving. It is the I like it, I don't like it mind. As soon as you recognize that tension and tightness in your head and you let it be, you relax. Something magical occurs. You don't have any thoughts in your mind. Your mind is very clear. Your mind is very bright. And your mind is pure. So as soon as you relax, you'll notice that your mind doesn't have any more tension in it. And 
it's clear. And you bring that clear mind to something wholesome. Now you've heard me talking about smiling. This is when I want you to smile. Smile. And bring that smiling, light mind that's pure, that doesn't have any craving in it, back to your object of meditation. And stay with your object of meditation as long as you can. Now, this is the way that the Buddha wanted us to practice meditation. This is the way to the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. When you let go of craving, you let go of suffering. So it's a real interesting thing, and it is kind of magical. As soon as you relax, you let that distraction be there. You don't keep your attention on it. Let's say you have uh, a sadness starting to come up. Well, you let that sadness be there by itself and relax the tightness caused by that sadness. And bring up something that's happy. Okay, bring up something that's also smile. Bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. I spend a lot of time teaching loving kindness meditation. <laughs> because Spend. your progress in loving kindness is much faster than it is with any other kind of meditation. Mindfulness of breathing. It does work, but its progress is very slow. When I say very slow, when you come and you do a 10 day retreat with me, you will have very, very good progress. To get to the same place by doing mindfulness of breathing, it's going to take about two weeks. Instead of 10 days, it's going to take closer to six weeks to get to the same place. That's how much faster the loving kindness actually is. So I much prefer teaching loving kindness. Now, a lot of people, they, they, they're attached to doing mindfulness of breathing. That's what they've been taught the whole time. But almost everybody that does mindfulness of breathing winds up doing the practice in the wrong way according to the Buddhist teaching. Okay? Now, according to the Buddhist teaching, Okay, I can change. I can change. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I will fix. Last one. This is exactly what it says in the Satipatthana Sutta. It okay, says, clear? You understand on the in-breath, you understand when it's wrong. Yes, we can see. Good. And on the out-breath, you understand when it's long. On the in-breath, you understand when it's short. And on the out-breath, you understand when it's short. Did you hear me say, nostril, nostril tip, breath? You heard me say breath. But... Focus, see the beginning, see the middle, and see the end of the in-breath. See the beginning, see the middle, and see the end of the out-breath. Did you hear me say that? No. Why? 
because it's not in the instructions that the Buddha gave. These are instructions that are coming from commentaries from other people, not the Buddha. Now, the next part of the instructions is he trains thus. So then now you know where we're getting down serious to it. So let, let me explain a little bit more. Uh, when it says he understands what it's like on the in breath and the out breath. Understands means that you see when your breath is long and when it's short, when your breath is fast and when it's slow, when your breath, breath is subtle and when it's very gross. You understand. It doesn't say focus on the breath. Actually, you wind up using your breath as the reminder to observe. And I'll explain that in a minute. The next part of the instructions, it says to <clears throat> train yourself thus. On the in-breath, see the bottom of the sea. Excuse me. Just had a uh, senior moment for a second. You experience the entire body, not body of breath, body. On the out breath, you experience the entire body. On the in breath, you tranquilize the bodily formation. On the out-breath, you tranquilize the bodily formation. This is a part of the meditation that you don't hear about. What does it mean? On the in-breath, you relax. On the out-breath, you relax. Relax what? The tightness in your head, in your mind. So you have a distraction, what do you do? You allow that disturbance, that hindrance to be there by itself. Relax. Come back to your uh, smile and your object of meditation and stay with your object of meditation. That's what the brochure is all about. The more you can follow these instructions precisely, the faster your progress in the meditation is. Now, when I teach loving kindness meditation, I want you to smile. When I teach mindfulness of breathing, guess what? No, I smile. want you to smile. Why? Because it improves your mindfulness. It improves your ability to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. It's real important. When I give a retreat, I want people to smile. I want people to laugh. I want people to have fun. That's kind of an odd thing coming from the meditation teacher. Almost everybody tells you, you got to try harder. More energy. What my job is to get you to stop trying so hard. Stop putting so much energy in. Then you start progressing very quickly. You start learning how to adjust the amount of energy you need to stay with your object of meditation. And it will change every time you go into a jhana. Now, I know that there's a lot of people in 
this country, we tend to learn that are very much hooked up to what is called Vipassana. What I teach is called Samatha Vipassana. That is being able to experience insights while you're in a jhana. What is a jhana? A jhana is a stage or level of understanding. Doesn't have anything to do with one point in this. Doesn't have anything to do with nimittas coming up. This has to do with understanding how mind actually works. So it's a real interesting phenomenon. This jhana practice. And I know that it's been talked about, oh, you're going to get attached if you get into jhana and you're not, you're not ever going to attain Nibbana. Well, that's not true. In the Anguttara Nikaya, in the Book of Course, section 123, 124, 125, it says, anybody that attains jhana, the way the Buddha is teaching, that means with the relaxed step in it, they, when they die from this realm, they'll be reborn in a Brahma Loka. If you're in the first Brahma Loka, you would think it's only going to be a quarter of the Nasaintaya that you're there. <laughs> but by the time you get out of that jhana, that merit wears down, you will attain final Nibbana from there. So you're going to be able to experience. If you experience the correct kind of jhana that the Buddha teaches, you get into jhana, you pretty much guarantee that you're going to experience nibbana and get off the wheel of sansara. Now, there's another part to this that says if you don't, if you practice jhana practice, but it's not the kind the Buddha taught. It's the absorption or one-pointed concentration mm -hmm. that doesn't have the relaxed step in it. Yeah. Then you'll be reborn in a Brahma Loka. And when that merit goes and it finally wears out, then your next rebirth is going to be in a hell realm. That shocked me when I read it. And I checked in other uh, other places and I think suttas and yeah, that's what it says. This is it. So you have to be careful with what kind of jhana you're practicing. Samatha vipassana, having insights into how the links of dependent origination actually work. Those are the insights that you have. And they're wonderful when they come up. Something will happen and all of a sudden you, you go, wow, that's how that works. When I went back to America, I started teaching. And I wanted to call this meditation an oh wow meditation. <laughs> We stopped because you. you have so many oh wows. <laughs> oh wow, that's how that works. We were afraid of it. <laughs> but I got vetoed. Somebody told me yeah, I couldn't do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, we just thought that the song would get upset. But <laughs> the whole thing with everything that I've been talking about leads to Nibbana if you use the relaxed step. Your sitting in meditation will get much better. Your daily life will become much easier. 
and everything will start to get to be more in line. How do you know when you're progressing in your meditation? Well, by your sense of humor. That's right. You start laughing <laughs> with things. With everything. Little things. Everything. And your sense of humor becomes very gentle and kind. That's how you know you're progressing. I had 20 years of straight vipassana. You know what was my mind was like? Rock. Critical. Judgmental. A lot of arguing. You don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about. That happens a lot. Well, when I started practicing loving kindness in this way, all of a sudden, that didn't happen so much. That wasn't so critical. I wasn't so hard. And that's another way of finding that you're doing it, you're on the right path. You become more helpful to people. You have more fun. You start laughing with simple little things. For instance, we have a dog that he loved to chase butterfly <laughs> shadows. And he'd run all over and he'd grab at them. And one day, he grabbed a butterfly and he stopped and he got this real surprised look on his face. And he didn't know what to do, so he just opened up his mouth and a butterfly flew out. That's great stuff. We have a lot of animals on our property that are very entertaining and fun to be around. But this is the thing that it seems to be missed a lot because so many monks are very much into dukkha and focusing on dukkha. Why don't we focus on the cessation of the dukkha? It seems to have been a lot more fun. And your mind becomes much more uplifted. And your face becomes much more beautiful when you're practicing love and kindness. In Malaysia, in Indonesia, I'm in Malaysia now, I gotta keep these things straight. In Indonesia, I have a lot of students that are very successful and they actually do attain Nibbana. When I was giving retreats there, I just stopped so, so I can come here and give retreats. When I was giving retreats there, 50% of the students became and made the soda bottle. Because they, there's a lot of confidence that you can attain that. And there's a lot of people that have attained it. So people are naturally having these experiences more and more. And it's real fun to go to, to Indonesia. Are we come to the end, huh? Yes, I think after this, uh, there is no files. No? Yes, okay. So I come back to you all and talk to you a little bit about this now. And um, I hope that, I'm really hoping everyone 
enjoyed listening to this this way. Uh, there will be some other things that I'm finding that we can possibly do this. We can uh, we can actually when he has something so clear. This was such a such a very clear lesson. I'm hoping that I can go to Yojna and ask her to let a hundred people listen to this because it is so clear. And it, it is a very good lesson to understand that you can take the steps of right effort very specifically and you can improve any kind of meditation you're practicing. It will help you to go deeper. Uh, you're, you're practicing uh, the Guenka or any other style of meditation, if you pay attention to the steps of the right effort, you're paying attention to how things can actually change. Now, you can realize that he is presenting this back in 2017, I think it was, uh, and that was about the time that he decided that all of the retreats should end with this lesson. <laughs> so a lot of times when you come to our retreats, you will hear Bhante teach this particular sutta. Uh, you, not, you won't hear him, but one of us will be teaching this particular lesson about this is how we should practice. This is how we should be practicing all the time. So why is it so important now that we pay attention to this lesson is because of the science that is happening, catching up with what Siddhartha actually found. And so what he did was he figured out neuroplasticity. And he, Bhante's talking to you in this little talk, he's showing you exactly how things change by doing these steps. And in neuroplasticity, it means plasticity means flexibility, flexibility of your brain to change the habitual patterns of behavior. And the behavior changes when we're practicing metta, you will have feeling inside, you don't have any feeling of hatred towards anybody or anything. You'll notice this. And then when it gets softer, the metta turns into karuna. And when it is softer and less strong, uh, this karuna stops you from, uh, it just, you stop having feelings of cruelty towards anyone. Somebody said to me, what's the difference between hatred and cruelty? Well, I can go to examples of people breaking up with each other. Uh, that's a kind of drama that everybody has been exposed to. Sometime you maybe have a breakup with somebody. And when you first break up with, a, with somebody, you might have feelings of hatred towards them. You know, this is all your fault. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything. It's all... It's all you, it's not me. And you have these, this kind of uh, dram dramatic uh, emotional stuff come up. But then what happens after a little bit of time, the compassion enters into this and compassion is sort of beginning to realize that, well, I messed up and because I messed up, this breakup happened, but the fact is you're messed up too and you don't have everything right either. So instead of thinking cruel things about each other and trying to mess each other's lives up, sometimes people, they stop hating each other but they still try to mess each other's lives up. You won't feel that way anymore. And this is something you don't take my word for it, but. When you experience this, my students come to me and they say, what is this? I'm not uh, um, mad at her anymore. I realize that uh, it was time for her to go or it was time for him to go. And 
that's just the way it is. And you start to let things fall into the past. This is what's happening to people. Okay. The third one, the third level is joy, but the joy you start, you might have this experience. And I did have this experience very clearly. And it, 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 and it surprised me that I had a very clear experience of being really happy for someone else's success. Tricky, tricky, because it's not me getting uh, really excited uh, about my success. It's me getting excited about Karen's success in something that she's trying to do or uh, Swapna is trying to accomplish something. And I get excited because you have succeeded. When you have that experience, you wonder what is that? And what it is, is empathy. It's genuine empathy is empath and empath feels what the other person feels. And you're starting to feel for another person this kind of joy. So you cannot have any discontent happening when you're having that kind of joy happen. That's what happened. You cannot have any discontent about the other person. Instead, you are feeling happy for the person. That's what that experience is. Okay, the fourth experience, it comes and gra it gradually develops and it, it takes a while for the deeper levels of it, but equanimity is upeka. Upeka is equanimity is an equal mind and it comes the word equal, equalizing the mind. Uh, you know, equalizing, upeka is um, equanimous. There you go, Equ equal, equanimous, equalizing the mind. And when your mind is equalizing or coming into strong, comfortable balance, soft, com comfortable balance, you don't have aversion towards anything. It's hard to have aversion towards anything. And so when we're talking about uh, in the very beginning of this discussion that he was teaching, uh, he starts out uh, going to the heart of the matter. The person that asked the question that this whole talk came from, they couldn't get along with somebody at work and they didn't like what people, what the person was behaving towards them. And they didn't like uh, the way people were acting, you see? And that sort of thing is a big so what? Now, why should I say it's a big so what? Because it disturbs you. <laughs> but it, it's a big so what because of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And this is where the three characteristics come. They poke themselves in very strongly. And Anicca is the one, the first one you hear about, Anicca. And Anicca is everything changes. And when everything is really changing all the time, you, you cannot go outside and draw a square idea i used to try and do this draw a square on the grass find a place where there's grass growing and and draw a square or put take some yarn you know some some, some <clears throat> string and and make a square on the ground now take a picture of the square and tomorrow come back and take a picture again and the next day take another picture and if you look really closely at these pictures, they're not the same. <laughs> everything is changing all the time in the universe. Everything is moving and flex. So coming back to the person who gets in your face at work and makes you, makes you angry or they, they're, they're saying mean things to you, it's a big so what? Because it's gonna change and it's all in your mind. And anything that you decide to believe when somebody says something to you, that can affect you. But what if you decide not to believe anything? There you go. So what if you decide not to believe anything? So when I talk to people about getting along with people, this is where the Buddha goes with this. 
he goes directly to the source of it's all your responsibility. It's nobody else's responsibility. And we don't like this. We would like to hang it on somebody else. We would like to say, well, God did this. It's their fault. Holy Mother's done it. It's her fault. It's my mother's fault. It's, <laughs> but it's not my fault, you know? And every, we wanna sit there and say, everything is happening to us. And we wanna say, it's happening to us and oh, poor pity me. But the truth is, if you start looking more deeply, you're going to see nothing is happening to you. So this is where I just say to you, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? Because it's on, it's on us. <laughs> You know, and we decide if we're going to laugh this off and we're going to change the way we decide to see things. And it's not always about laughing things off either. It's about seeing things clearly and making a decision to take charge. That's what it is. Of what you decide is really happening. Okay. So who wants to come on here and Jump in on this. I'm sorry, I'm dark there. I can't fix that. I don't know how. <laughs> so what's what do you think about this? Light or bulb over there, you can uh, switch on. Uh, the what? A bulb or a light or something you can switch uh, on. I, you know, I can try. Um, because in certain angles, uh, we can see you, and in certain angles, you are dark. No? I'm kind of a ghost. Better? We will not know un un unless you sit. <laughs> I, I, I'm in this big table, and I, I have an idea. There's one way we keep trying to figure out. We don't have a backdrop. We our green, our green screen didn't get sent to us. It's too big to stand. So we'll close this. When you are hungry, we'll buy you a new one, green screen. And we can go like this. Oh, there's a rainbow. I see a rainbow. <laughs> That's cool. We have magic windows here. We can. Close this. I live in a place where when you're sleeping, I live in a place that's backwards. I live way in the north right now. And so when I go to bed, the lights are on outside. And everything is different here. We have to close down things in order to sleep. Yeah, but you get used to it after a while, but it's backwards. <laughs> yeah? Now let's see what happens. Mm. I have strange things on today. I actually found an orange that matched my robe and someone helped me to get a, this blanket and it was the very last one in the store I wanted to get one and, uh, and they took it off the mannequin. <laughs> they took it off the mannequin and, and got it for me. <laughs> I thought it was really funny. And I said, they're stripping the mannequin <laughs> and got this. So that was kind of and fun. Can you uh, just uh, tilt your uh, screen a little bit uh, down? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now and, uh, so, so this somebody, is a scarf yeah. uh -huh. because I cover, I cover over the, the, uh, I have a neck brace, neck brace to protect the spine. And in order to do that, I have to wear it all the time. And I said to her, the doctor, I said, all the time. And she said, all the time. In other words, you can take it off to take a shower, but that's it. And you put it back on, you have to sleep with it and everything. So we're working on, on what we're gonna do about that. But, but the thing is uh, all the time, that's a lot. And, 
And so um, we thought the boys got this idea that my, 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 I have medical security people that I'm not allowed, I, I don't go for walks by myself. They come with me so I can't fall or if I get dizzy, they're with me. I, I can walk and exercise, but someone should be with me. <laughs> so, so they are like following me like behind and in front of me if I go for walks and if I go to the mall, they come with me and stuff like that. And one of them said, why don't we just get something to, to cover this because it's very rough and it was cutting, cutting you here, you know? So we wrapped this up one night and said, this is good. And then this is very soft. This can go with my, with my, uh, as you can see, I match Bonte when I'm in this. That's why I guess so. We, we got uh, this very soft blanket is just right for me. <laughs> and so that's what I was wearing today. I when think I somebody came. has a question. Huh? So, okay, yeah. <laughs> question time. Uh, yes, yeah, Sister Kema, I have a question. Can you hear me clearly or not? I can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so on Bante Dhamma talk, Bante said, when you take care, of Dharma, Dharma will take care of you. Correct. You might not get what you want, but you will get what you need. That's correct. So my question is, uh, yeah, uh, you will get what you need. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how to take care of Dharma in real life example? We just, <laughs> you want to know what we did? So uh, in the center, in the beginning, this is like in 2003, uh, in the, it was cold, in Missouri was cold in the wintertime. And so Bonte wanted to go to Florida to teach in the wintertime where it's warm. But, you know, uh, we had to pay for the property and the, the property purchase uh, had payments and everything. And it, when we left for, Actually, for this happened for about four years. It happened this way. When we left the property to drive to Florida, which is like four days to drive down there and to, uh, you know, be able to survive and give lessons and classes and teach retreat and everything there, we only had like one or two thousand dollars in the bank. That's nothing, nothing, it's nothing, okay? To leave in the bank at, there when we left. So the question was, how will we do this? How will we have enough money to, what will happen? And so what is what happened to us was thinking all the time, what will happen if we were worried about what would happen in the future, meaning tomorrow, next week, next month, when we drive down there to do this teaching, Dhamma, what will we do? Should we think about this all the time? Should we worry about how to get donations? Should we ask people for money? What should we do? And he just would say, if you take care of the Dhamma, uh, the Dhamma will take care of you. And did I believe him? Well, <laughs> I was a person who had my own business for 14 years, I was a CEO, a, co a commander in chief of, you know, of, of a small business of nine or 10 people. I had my own business for 14 years and I was very concerned about money. And so was the person who was our treasurer at that time worried about where will money come from? How will we pay the electric while you're gone? Who will pay for the water? Will there be enough money to pay for the mortgage, et cetera? Just worry, 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 worry. And we just said, don't worry, just teach the Dhamma. And I said, just teach the Dhamma. <laughs> and we just taught the Dhamma. We, I made a commitment to Bhante I would not speak about worrying about any of the money coming. I would not worry about anything. I would just, in my mind, believe that everything would work perfectly and I would teach the Dhamma. So he taught me to teach the Dhamma and that's all we do. We teach you the Dhamma. 
you might notice that we don't counsel people a lot about personal problems. We don't get on the phone with you like a, psycholog a psychologist and spend two or three hours with you counseling you uh, that kind of way. Uh, we teach you how to uh, how the suffering is happening to you. We teach you exactly what's causing your suffering is your personal worry about the future. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Uh-oh, what's going to happen? If you do that, you won't be able to sleep. You won't be able to eat. You'll be uncomfortable at home. All these things will bother you. Yeah, but if you just get down to working and just doing what you're supposed to be doing, everything will work out fine. Is it perfectly easy to do this? No, because it took me four years to just give up thinking about this. And finally, one day I realized I wasn't thinking about money at all anymore. And we don't keep money either. This is another thing people don't know. In Damasuka, our, the way that I was trained, is that if someone gives you money in a donation, you have 24 hours to get rid of it. <laughs> so the money, if you gave me, uh, one time here, I'll give you an example. One time I taught at a big temple. This is a great big temple in, in uh, Malaysia. And after the teaching was over, they brought these baskets of donation for the people who had been teaching. They put the baskets down and we were sitting in the kitchen taking money out of the envelopes into a bowl. And I thought it was for the temple. I thought, I thought we were giving all this money to the temple. <laughs> and those were my baskets. And they, and they were baskets for us for teaching. And so, so I, at the end, there was $700 in the basket. And I said, That's, don't you want some for the temple? And they just looked at me funny and said, no, it's money, it's the donation. So I took the donation and went back to where I was staying. And when I went back uh, to, uh, to where I was, I was staying, I gave away $400 to somebody who had no money. So this is the kind of thing that we were doing. This is, this is the kind of thing that was happening. So $400 went into the account to protect us the money we needed for travel. But the other money was given to a couple of nuns that had no support and they didn't have any help from anyone and we just gave the money to them. So by giving the money to them, we got what we needed to do everything we needed to do, didn't we? So we don't necessarily get $700, but we got the money we needed for us to be able to house ourselves and to be able to have people take care of us. And it just works. Now, how can I explain to you how that works? You have to believe in it. You have to turn yourself over to living that way. And it's against what the modern world is telling you. They tell you, you have to worry about your money, worry, worry, worry worry about what's gonna to happen tomorrow, worry what's happening next week, and you have to feel bad about what you maybe made a mistake yesterday and worry about how you made a mistake yesterday. Let it all go. Try living in the present time, just in the present time, not the present moment. Try living in the present time with what you're doing and do one thing at a time and do it well. And if you keep doing that, you will become an expert at what you're trying to do. You will have the answers for other people. You will be able to help people, but not at the cost to yourself. You understand? You have to trust in the universe. This is a universal law. What you put out, you get back. If you don't put anything out for people, you don't get anything back pretty easy. What goes around comes around. All of this is karma. This is karma. And understanding karma, surrendering to karma, karma just means action. Karma means action. But your intention has to be not for yourself, but to helping yourself and others all together. And so what you put out to help people, that's what you get back. Have you ever had the experience where you really need help? Uh, you know, like something bad happens and people come to help you. And if you look back, 
probably you were helping them when something happened bad to them one time before, and then they're there for you. I had storms come to Damasuka, big storms came. And when we were helping the neighbors, then the days after that, they came and helped us. So in the country, when we put out, we get back. What we put into something, it comes around. This is natural law. If we wanna cancel natural law, that's okay, but I don't wanna cancel natural law. My whole life is living on natural law. And when I'm giving to you, then you're giving back to me. It makes sense, Kirana? Uh, yeah, Sister Kema, that makes sense. And yeah, I'm just like wondering, uh, like, um, Scientists, like, all right, scientists and yeah. doctors and laboratory research people, they have a lot of trouble with this. They can't seem to understand it, but it's real. And it's part of the nature of the human being and the nature of your experience. These are natural laws that we're talking about. What you put out, you get back. Also the five precepts, you keep the five precepts. Uh, oh precepts. boy, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, keeping six, the pre six okay. precepts. Yeah, see, keeping the precepts was the whole part I left out here. Keeping the precepts, if you're keeping the precepts, then you're not producing anything negative. The pre he talked a lot about this in the talk. And if you're keeping your precepts, you're not producing any scars. If you're breaking precepts, you're producing little hurts inside yourself and those come around and they block you. That's where your barriers come from. That's where things get complicated. You don't break your precepts, you keep your precepts. And then you don't have any little bumps in the road to worry about. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, last Everybody? question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Keep it coming. Okay, so uh <laughs> uh last time I I listened uh Bante Damagawesi uh give the talk about uh if we donate or do charity, don't hurt yourself, right? But the other uh Dhamma talk from David on YouTube. Uh, I heard that he said, uh, if you don't want to give, uh, just give. Maybe that's the time, like uh, that's the one chance that you can give and maybe it will be like fruit more than that you think. So which one I have to go here? That's up to you. <laughs> it's not up to me. Nobody sets rules to tell you what to do with that. Somebody gives something, who can, you know, you're talking about how much you give in a situation. Well, some people can give you a dime and some people can give you a dollar. I mean, I'll tell you a story. In most religions, I have found the same story, okay? Once upon a time, there was a little boy at Christmas time and the Christian, Christian version is like this. There was a village in Germany and it had a, beautiful church and it had uh it had the mother mary uh, you know it's catholic little catholic church and and it had a um, you know mother mary statue and um everybody wanted to see mary cry because if she cried it meant that she was being given something very very important that that um because when mary cried everyone in the village was able to have enough food and everyone was able to not have enough heat everyone would be fine for the winter if mary would cry and this is like a statue story okay and so what happened was rich people came to the service and they put all this donation for food in baskets in front of mary and mary didn't cry you know and then people laid down bags of gold and jewels and all kinds of things. And then suddenly everybody was sitting there praying, but nothing was happening. And the door opened. In through the door came a tiny little boy. 
he was dressed in rags. He was cold. He had an old blanket wrapped around. Maybe connection issue. Sister Kima, I'll try and call her. You're on mute, huh? You're on mute, unmute. Your mic is off, uh, Sister Kima. Mic, mic is off. Uh, the mic, you look I'm at, uh, okay. I'm okay. <laughs> No, it was very funny. It said your energy is low, it's going, and then it went. Okay, so the very first thing I just told Dama Gavesi was Mary cried <laughs> because the little boy came through the door and he walked down to the front of the church and he stood in front of the statue and he only had one sixpence. It's one little tiny coin. And he took the coin out of his pocket and he put it down at the feet of Mary and he kneeled down and he said a prayer and, Ma and Mary cried. See, so the point is, it doesn't matter what you give, Kirana, it doesn't matter. One time I was uh, walking alms in a village where the houses were about a kilometer for one house and the kilometer you had to walk for another house. When I got to the front gate of a small house, there was a woman who ran outside very quickly to me and the other nun. We had just two of us were walking alms and she ran up, up. I couldn't look at her. We're not allowed to look at you in the face. And I stopped and she came over and she took one potato chip and she reached over like this and put it in my bowl very, very carefully. What is the point of one potato chip to help me eat in the morning in my alms bowl? That's all she had, Kirana. She only had a potato chip and then she had the food for her husband and son in the little tiny house in the forest. That's all she had. So she gave the most that she could give. You see? So how do we measure these things? <laughs> yeah, this is a heart thing. It's a heart and mind and intention thing. You give with a sincere intention one coin and Mary cried in the church, you give one potato chip because that's all you had to give. And you gave the most of anyone. How do we explain these things? That's how it works, okay? We, lo we lose a lot today because we don't have stories and oaths and understanding words and curses and all these things we'd like to get rid of and pretend they don't exist. Actually, they do exist. But we decided in modern times, scientifically, we're not going to look at them anymore. And you 
do what you do in life, but I'll tell you what, if you take care of the Dhamma, Dhamma is going to take care of you and you will get what you need. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sister Kema and Bhante. So we say, we say, uh, this is about it. <laughs> okay. I hope, I hope that you like the program today. If you like the program, please tell us. Please let us know that you liked it so that we can maybe find some others that are good like this too. Okay. Okay. Here we go. May suffering ones be suffering may free and suffer stroke fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share the merit we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. And may beings inhabiting space and earth. Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's, Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I bet you to the bell. <laughs> it was good. Okay, I hope I see you all next time.